the insight, insight. the insightum podcast genetics human archaeology denisovans neanderthals metabolism ancestry where in the world did we come from i am unique dna genome from austin, austin texas. texas this week journey of man redux hello everyone just a quick shout out um i figured we've done a few podcasts now and uh we think this is a really great, great product. You know, it's free, so that's great. If you would promote us, um, it's really great if you listen directly on Libsyn or something like that. But um, if you would subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, that would be better. If you would leave a positive review, that would be the best. Um, we really want to get the word out there about the topics that we're interested in because we're very passionate. And we want as many people listening and just getting to understand human history and genetics the way we do. If you could do that, we'd be really, we'd really appreciate it. So I'm Spencer Wells, founder and CEO of Insightome. And I am Razib Khan, the director of content at Insightome. And this week we're talking about a book that I wrote. Started writing it in 2001. It was published at the end of 2002 in the UK, beginning of 2003 in the US, so 15 years ago, called The Journey of Man. And it was also made into a documentary film. Now, Razib, I think you've read this book, in fact. Yes, I, I read the book. Uh, actually, I might have watched the documentary before I read the book. So I believe I watched the documentary in February of 2003. And then I read the book right after that, I think. Yeah, so the documentary um, premiered just, you know, 15 years ago as of like... I don't know, 10 days ago or something like that. Okay. 15 so I, years back from that. So it was like end of January, 2003. Uh, yeah. That sounds And right. it was, well, let's talk a little bit about what went into yeah. Yeah. making Journey of Man. Let's start off with the title. Yes. Which is not meant to be offensive to anyone. I'm not trying to leave out 50% of the population. Um, it was a play on Jacob Bernofsky's Ascent of Man. Okay. Yes. I know um, which book. was a famous book and BBC documentary in the 1970s. And I was walking down the street in Sydney, Australia. This was beginning of 2001 when we were trying to get the film commissioned by PBS and National Geographic. And we had gone to the World Congress of Science and Factual Producers, which is this big gathering of basically documentary filmmakers from around the world. And we'd pitched it. And we were walking back from some of those pitches. Um, this was a colleague of mine from Tigris Productions in the UK, based in London, which is who actually made the documentary. And we were like kicking around ideas for the title, like Human Journey, whatever. And I'm like, well, what about riffing on Ascent of Man, which is like such a classic in like the study of anthropology and humanity, all about the rise of civilization. I said, what about Journey of Man? Because this is all about migrations. Yeah. And Justine Kershaw, who was the executive producer who was with me, is like, yeah, I think that's good. So it's riffing on that, but it, it also has a second meaning, namely the book and the film are all about how we use the Y chromosome yes. to track human migration patterns. Yes. And the Y is only found in men. It's the piece of DNA that, that makes you male. So boys inherit it from their fathers who got it from their fathers and so on. So it traces a purely paternal line of descent. Yes, and which is why so it, it dovetails really well with the title of the documentary and the book, obviously. I mean, within um, the documentary itself, you started with some molecular genetic methods and the revolution that led up to Y chromosomal phylogeography and phylogenetics, basically. Can you just back up maybe a couple of decades really quickly and just our list so our listeners understand like where you started from around you know, 1998 or so? Yeah, it actually goes back further than that. So when I was an undergrad just up the road at the University of Texas in Austin, you know, mid-80s, DNA sequencing was really just getting off the ground. Like when I took my first genetics class in like 85, there were a handful of like viral genomes that had been sequenced and then little pieces of mm -hmm. bacterial DNA. Yeah. But like, DNA sequencing was not a part of genetics. Like genetics was about, you know, Punnett squares and P's and quantitative genetics, lots of math. And, you know, DNA just wasn't a part of it. And, you know, Luca Cavalli-Sforza, who's really the godfather of human population genetics, 
You know, all the work that he started doing in the 1950s and 60s and, and so on is all based on protein polymorphisms. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, blood groups and HLA types and, you know, these these variable proteins that you could detect using biochemical methods. There's allocines. And... Yeah, and they were a proxy, you know, yeah. for the DNA yeah. differences. Um, ultimately, they're a result of, you know, variation in the DNA, but people couldn't assay that variation mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. easily. And so, you know, even as late as, you know, 88 when I was applying to grad school, the idea of doing human population genetics was, you know, it was kind of a pipe dream. It yeah, was like, you very know, blue actually, sky. Yeah, like, you know, we were still debating whether it was theoretically possible to sequence a human genome yes, in yes. those days. And, and let me just jump in with a little perspective. And I've mentioned this before. So, you know, you know, close listeners, just bear with me. In the late 1990s, uh, Cavalli Forza published the History and Geography of Human Genes. Actually, it, early 1990s. So early I think it came out in like 1994. 94. So the year okay. I was finishing yeah, yeah, grad yeah. school. So yeah. I read it in 98. Okay. <laughs> so for me, it was 98. And in that book, there was about a thousand individuals that he analyzed at, you know, maybe like a couple of hundred markers max. Yeah, there were a few hundred markers. Again, they're mostly these blood groups yes. that, that vary a lot, you know, RH, MN, yeah. ABO, you know, there were lots of blood groups. And this is work that goes back to, you know, the early days yes. of recognizing biochemical variation yep. in humans. So Carl Landsteiner in 1901 defined the A and B blood groups and won a Nobel Prize for it. It's yep. this heritable biochemical variation that, you know, distinguishes people. They had no idea what it was doing, why it was there, but you could study it. And then, of course, they started making use of it for blood transfusions in the First World War. And uh, the Hirschfelds, a dynamic duo in the early days of population genetics, they were actually doctors on the Eastern Front. They started noticing differences in the frequencies of A and B blood groups. Yes. And they came up with a theory about, you know, two different origins of humanity. One was like pure A, one was pure B, and they've mixed along this line. Yeah. And, you know, then you get Arthur Morant by the 1940s and 50s, and he's looking at lots of blood groups and lots more populations. And the question is like, how do you make sense of it? And Cavalli Swartz is the one who really came along and started to make sense of it. Yeah, and what I would say is Cavalli Forza's work is the culmination of, as you indicated there, a century of research and analysis using classical methods. The sequencing revolution in 1998 was not a revolution yet. We had not had the first whole genome. So when you came out with Journey of Man, it was kind of in an in-between stage where we were starting to get a sense of molecular phylogenetics and these sorts of like computational analyses. But we didn't have as much data as we have now. Oh, it definitely not. So, you know, when I started grad school, I decided that I was going to do my PhD working on fruit flies yeah. with Dick Lewinton, who is another one of these godfathers in population genetics. You know, he did some seminal work in human population genetics, but it's population genetics more broadly. And he trained as a statistician, mathematician, but, you know, applied those techniques to the study of, of variation in natural populations. And he worked on fruit flies as his model system. And their genome is much smaller than the human genome. So it was actually possible to like, you know, clone genes. This was pre-PCR. Could you believe that? Like PCR is the basis of everything, nearly everything so we what, do in molecular biology. It's a way of amplifying yeah. small regions of the genome. So you can basically isolate sections out to study them. And the way I like to think about it is, imagine you know there is one sentence in the Sunday New York Times that you want to study. You're you know not sure exactly where it is, but if you had a way to literally amplify that sentence billions of times, suddenly it would like be the only thing that you saw. That's basically what PCR does. You create large copy numbers of one particular segment of DNA, and then you can sequence it, determine yeah. what the sequence of nucleotides is. So this was pre-PCR. Fruit flies were more tractable yes. as an organism. And in those days, like, we were all looking for evidence of selection. So this was like Marty Kreitman's work mm -hmm. and Dick Hudson and, you know, all these statistical tests had been developed. And so that's what the goal was in population genetics. And it turned out that we either couldn't generate enough data to see selection acting, which is probably true most of the time, or demographic history is actually more important yes. in many cases than the selective history. Yes. And so what I ended up studying, you know, at the end was kind of the demographic history of fruit flies. Not terribly exciting to me, mm -hmm. but the demographic history of humans is fascinating. And so the, the techniques had moved on at that point. So this is 93, 94 yeah. as I'm finishing up my PhD. 
And, you know, we suddenly had the ability to look at, you know, DNA polymorphisms in humans, in the human genome. You know, we had PCR and so on. And, of course, Alan Wilson's group had studied, you know, mitochondrial DNA, come up with mitochondrial yep. Eve. African Eve. And, you know, started thinking about, well, you know, I really want to get into human population genetics, my original love, the reason why I wanted to study all of this. And Dick Lewington said, listen, you need to go work with Luca Cavalli Sforza. And so talk to Luca and... The rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's step back really quickly about Out of Africa, because you mentioned Mitochondrial Eve. Mitochondrial Eve was mitochondrial in part because it was in the pre-PCR era. So mitochondrial copious, you can get DNA from them relatively easily. In yeah, there, there are lots of copies in every cell. Yeah. This is why ancient DNA also started with mitochondria. It's just low-hanging fruit, right? But mitochondrial Eve kind of revolutionized our understanding of the molecular origins of modern humanity in the 1980s. And you took over in the 1990s, to some extent, your group um, at Stanford with Luca with Y chromosomes, right? Yeah. So, you know, mitochondrial DNA is the female equivalent of the Y chromosome in a sense because it traces a purely maternal line. Everybody's carrying it, but you only get it from your mother. And that's because mitochondria, the structures in the cell that contain mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial genome, about 16 and a half thousand nucleotides long. It's circular, present in a single copy, doesn't recombine. I'm not going to go into too many of the technical reasons why it's a really good way to study these things. But basically, the mitochondria are structures found in the cytoplasm of the cell. And you get your cytoplasm during fertilization and then embryonic development from your mom. The egg furnishes all the cytoplasm, and the sperm only provides DNA to the nucleus. Therefore, all the mitochondria that you get are from your mother. And so it tells you about your mother's 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 mother. So we had this information coming out of Alan Wilson's group and others looking at mitochondrial DNA. And the question was, can we start to do the same thing on the male line? You know, yes. tell the other side of the story, so to speak. And so I remember this is actually work that Rob Dorrit did in Wally Gilbert's lab at Harvard when Rob was a postdoc with him. Back in the early 90s, he sequenced like 900 base pairs, which was a lot at the time, yeah. of the Y chromosome in like 57 guys from around the world. And big data, that, that, Yeah, big yeah. data in like 91, 92. 90, okay, yeah. And what he found was they're all identical. So basically, they literally could have had the same father. Yeah. And so... You know, the the real problem with the Y chromosome, as we soon discovered, is that it's really hard to find genetic variants. The level of variation in mitochondrial DNA is much, much higher than yeah. it is on the Y chromosome. So the real study of Y chromosome variation, because sequencing took so long and because it was so expensive yeah. back in those days. So these are applied biosystems, Sanger sequencing, you're pouring gels yeah. and loading lanes and really, really ancient techniques these days. The way we had to do it was Peter Uffner and Peter Underhill, two postdocs in Luca's group at Stanford, starting in about 94, 95, the time I arrived, found a new way to assay variation. And so it was called DHPLC, mm -hmm. so yes. denaturing HPLC, high-performance liquid chromatography, blah, blah, blah. It's a way of assaying kind of the shape and structure of molecules. And so what they would do is they would PCR one Y chromosome, so one individual, certain segment of the Y, same segment and another individual, they would melt them by heating them up so the double strands break apart. Denature. Then they would re-anneal them, and so they would come back together. And if there was a mismatch between the two individuals, it would migrate through the HPLC column differently. Yeah. And so they could pick up genetic variants. So it was a way of very rapidly in those days finding places where there was variation, and then you could go in and sequence the ones that had variants. And so we started discovering these genetic variants, which, again, based on Rob Dorrit's work, were so rare. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the very first named Y chromosome polymorphism was the Y alu polymorphism. Okay. Actually discovered by Michael Hammer mm, yeah, um, when he know. was a postdoc in Lewinton's lab. So he found it when he was doing his postdoc there. And it was designated later on M1, okay, or YAP. Um, That's the one that goes back to Africa? So it's found inside and outside of Africa. Yeah. And the debate is, you know, did it originate in Africa? Did it originate in Asia, migrate back into Africa? I think there's still some question about that. Mm -hmm. So those of you who follow Y chromosome nomenclature, this is basically the root of DE, 
Oh, yeah. So haplogroup D and haplogroup E both are YAP positive. Yeah. And so the question is, like, you know, D is found in Asia, E is found in Africa and outside of Africa. So did it originate in Asia, migrate back? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Still not sure. Anyway, so that was M1. And, you know, there were very few additional M, M standing for marker, um, M's that had been discovered. And so as we started to assay variation using this DHPLC technique, we started to pick up M3. M3 is the into the Americas lineage. Mm -hmm. So this is found at frequencies of nearly 100% in most Native American populations. Yeah. Not found outside of the Americas. So yeah. these really cool, like, differences, sharp regional divides yes. in the distribution. And that's why the Y suddenly became so exciting. Mm -hmm. Then we found M9. Mm -hmm. And that's basically everybody outside of Africa Okay, is M9 positive. This, this, this is sounding familiar also to people who... Um kept track of mitochondrial Eve, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We found in one of my samples from Central Asia. So I started doing my work in Central Asia in I think I know where you're going 96, here. one we called M17. Oh, yeah. This is the one that defines R1A. Yeah, that's my haplogroup. Just <laughs> give a shout out to all the R1As listening out there. And it had a crazy distribution, which we've talked about in previous podcasts. Yeah. I mean, it's the found... Indoor. You know, very high frequency in Russian populations, 50%, but it's also found at a frequency of like 30, 40% in Northern India. Yeah. You know, and yeah. It, again, we had never seen patterns like this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it became pretty apparent that the Y was going to be a really powerful tool for studying population migration patterns. Yeah. And if anybody has listened to the Indo-European podcast, you will know that this is 20 years after M17 was discovered, and they're still doing work on it and confirming frankly, what you already saw. Yeah, basically, basically. So, you know, we started to see these patterns and assemble the first tree of Y chromosome variants. And, you know, I had moved on from Luca's lab in 1998, went on a crazy expedition. Everybody told me I was crazy to do it, but a lot of really cool things came out of it. We were sponsored by Land Rover, and this is following up on the trip I did in 96, where we went to Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. We had all these samples from like the heart of the Silk Road, trying to understand who the people in Central Asia were, Turks, Indo-Iranians, Mongols, etc., that had moved through there. And it was apparent that we needed a lot more data from surrounding populations. And I'm like, well, you know, we need to sample in the Caucasus. We need to sample in Iran. We need to sample up near the Altai, you know, all over Kazakhstan. Um, that kind of is a hard thing to do if you're flying between locations. So I'm like, well, let's do it as a driving expedition. So we approached Land Rover, and they gave us a brand new discovery. And in April of 1998, we set off on a six-month overland journey collecting DNA samples known as Eurasia 98. And it was one of the first expeditions to be done semi-live on the internet. So I taught myself HTML, coded mm -hmm. up our homepage, and we did posts from the field. Is that still up? Uh, I have the code sitting on my computer. It's currently not online, but I I'd love to get it oh, yeah. back up there. You know, I mean, it sounds like it's, um, it's pretty janky looking. For it is. I mean, I think I've seen. I think I've seen some. <laughs> but of the it pages. was cool at the time. I yeah, mean. <laughs> and I think maybe um, you know, I have heard fragments of this, you know, voyage from you over the years. I'm thinking maybe we have another podcast idea, but you know. Yeah. You know. No, I'd, I'd love to talk about that. But anyway, so at that point, I had moved on. Um, I was out in the field. You know, among other things that came out of that expedition was the discovery of Genghis Khan's Y chromosome, which we can talk about in a future podcast. Yeah. But came back and got a research position at the University of Oxford and was basically genotyping all these new Y chromosome markers in samples from all over Eurasia. And again, starting to see some really cool patterns. You, you know, were the first you were the first one that saw a lot of this. I mean that's that's a cool place to be as a scientist. It was so incredible, literally. So we had all these markers that, you know, we had discovered in Cavalli's lab and that Peter and Peter had continued to discover, you know, while I was out in the field. And so I had access to all this information because we were collaborating and we had all these samples, and literally every time you ran an assay, you'd see a new pattern that no one had ever seen about human yeah. history. So it was a really, really fun time. And so I started to, like, you know, collate all this stuff and, and try and figure out, well, what is this telling us about the great migrations around the world? And, you know, again, no one had really done that yeah. up to that point, you know, because Wait, so, the Y chromosome is such a powerful tool because so, the differences between populations yes, are yes. so extreme. So what do we know from the from the mtDNA so far, though? I mean, where I mean, I know some a lot of the listeners will know, but like, what where were you starting out with in terms of your framework? 
Yeah, so the, the mitochondrial DNA painted a very broad brush view of the emergence of our species in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, within the last 200,000 years. And at some point in the last 100-ish thousand years, we left Africa. There was some suggestion that there were two migrations, a coastal migration along the south coast of Asia, another inland migration. But in terms of like timings of various things, I mean, they were pretty close on entry to the Americas. I think the initial estimates were like 30,000 years ago. It's yeah. probably closer to 20. But yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, we originate in Africa, we move into Asia, which is kind of obvious and self-evident, like to get anywhere outside of Africa, you yeah. have to move into Asia. And then at some point you end up in Europe and the Americas. And so it wasn't that compelling. And the dates were really like the ranges were huge and... So the Y chromosome, again, because of these sharp differences between populations, and, and you know, this is because of the way humans behave. You know, for the most part, group identity in most populations is determined by who your father was. Your clan membership is determined by your paternal line. And so the Y chromosomes tend to track populations a little more closely, except in ones that are matrilineal, where the women determine mm -hmm. group membership. And so, you know, the, the demarcations and frequency between populations for Y chromosome variants or lineages is sharper. Much yeah. more so distinct. So the FST. Yes, will, exactly. So I was going to, you know, for listeners, basically you can have as much diversity. Let's assume that there's the same amount of diversity in the Y and the mtDNA when you pool it together. The Y can still be much more informative if that diversity tends to be partitioned between geographical groups, if geographical and historical information is what you want. And that is what Spencer is alluding to. Yeah, exactly. So started to pull all this information together and 99, I believe it was, there was a film crew that was, um, I got a call out of the blue. We had gotten, you know, a fair amount of press. We actually had a photographer who came with us on that Eurasian 98 expedition and the Independent, which is one of the big newspapers in the UK, their Sunday magazine did a big story based on Mark's photographs and the story of what we were trying to do with the genetic samples. And so, you know, that was my first kind of foray into the media and popularizing science. And got a call from some filmmakers based in London who were doing a three-part series on race and genetic differences, or lack thereof. And that was the question for, I think it was Channel 4 in the UK, which is one of the big terrestrial channels. And they said, we would love to come and interview you. And I said, yeah, absolutely. So... They came and they spent a day in the lab in Oxford and told them all about what I was doing and talked a lot about, you know, the the apportionment of variation, the classic Lewinton, you know, 85%, 7%, 8%, all of that. And the fact that there's more variation within populations than between, et cetera, et cetera. But following up on that, they got really excited about the Y chromosome stuff. And they're like, this is pretty amazing. Like, you can draw these lines on a map just mm -hmm. using DNA. Yeah. We should be doing a film on that. And I said, okay. But I want to be involved because I want to make sure the science is mm -hmm. told in a responsible way. Wait, let me let me jump in really quickly. When he says, when Spencer says you can draw the lines on the map, w there are downsides of using uniparental, like mtDNA and Y. One of the upsides is it is literally a tree phylogeny because there's no mixing between paternal and maternal lineages. So when you create a phylogeny out of the Y or the mtDNA, you can lay it on a map if the geographic partitioning is very good right and that's one of the upsides and i think that was why around the year 2000 it kind of captures the public's imagination because it's so easy to digest yeah i mean the world was a lot simpler in those days pre 9 11 <laughs> in a lot of ways yeah i mean the story that we started to piece together was one of you know a recent and rapid emergence of modern humans out of Africa around 50,000 years ago, completely replacing anything else that was out there, the Neanderthals. We didn't even know about Denise events in those days. But, you know, Neanderthals suddenly go extinct. They're not in our, you know, ancestry mm -hmm. at all. And, you know, this migration pattern around the world. And so I started piecing together this migration pattern and talking to these guys. And they're like, no, seriously, I think there's a film in this. And I'm like, I've never, like, acted. Like, how, what is a, I'm not a filmmaker. And they're like, no, 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 you should be telling the story. So long story short, we did manage to get it commissioned by the National Geographic Channel internationally. So it broadcast around the world, outside of the U.S. and Canada, on the National Geographic Channel. And it broadcast in the U.S. and Canada on PBS. And at the same time, you know, I felt very strongly, you know, there's only so much you can present mm -hmm. in a film, even if it's a documentary, like films by their very nature, like present a couple of pieces of new information every half an hour, and that's about all they can slam in there. So I wanted to write a book that went along with it. 
And, you know, so I ended up getting the book commissioned by Penguin in the UK, and it was later published by Princeton in the US, and then Random House bought the paperback rights. But so it's kind of moved around a bit. But I was in this position of like, you know, at that point, I actually had a job as director of genomics at a startup genomics company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Did I leave that? Did I become a writer and a filmmaker for a year? Like, that's yes. risky. <laughs> and so I decided to do that. I'm like, how often do you get these opportunities in life? And I'm young enough that, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can always get another job. So for a year, we traveled around the world, 12 countries on pretty much every continent except Antarctica, filming that. And I was writing the book at the same time. And so we finished it up in 2002. It aired on the National Geographic Channel internationally at the end of 2002, and that's when the UK edition of the book was published. I gave the very first book reading slash presentation on this at the Royal Geographical Society um, at the end of October or beginning of November 2002. It's the very first time I'd presented this work. And um, then it aired on PBS, as we were talking about, in January 2003. The response was amazing. I mean, I, I've got sitting on my laptop now literally hundreds of emails people had seen the film and it had affected them so much that they went online to figure out who I was and found my email address and they would write to me and they would say things like you know, the one that really sticks with me was this guy wrote in and he said you know I'm flipping through the channels and you know hit on you know the San Bushman speaking click languages in South Africa, and I'm mesmerized by this. And so I grab my wife, and we sit down, and we start to watch, and then we start hearing about genetics and how we populated the world. So we got our son out of bed who loves history, and we sat glued to the television for two hours, and it's changed our perception of who we are. You know, things like that. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. this, this is going to have an impact. And it did. You know, a lot of things came out of it, including later on the Genographic Project. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I'm um, just personal like recollection of this period. At that point, um, you know, I was working as a web developer, and I had an undergraduate degree in biochemistry with a minor in history. And um, I had read Cavalli Fortz's book, 1998, um, the unabridged version, front to back. I was a little vague on what PCA was then. In any case, uh, the history part was interesting to me. And I remember like your book and your documentary came out. And then Brian Sykes had a book, Seven Daughters of Eve. And I think Stephen Oppenheimer might have. There's a few other people. There was a period when a lot of books were coming out on genetics and history right after the Human Genome Project, I feel. But before genomics became ubiquitous and almost banal, right? So it was still kind of um, wondrous might be a term, like this new technology, this new era. I remember like being like, wow, this is, this is different than, this is different than the 1990s. Like in the 1990s, Biology was different. Genetics was still genetics and not genomics. And when I watch your documentary or I'm reading about these these population geneticists working with bigger data, all of a sudden, I think I started to get a sense of what the future was like. And I think that's what other people were also perceiving. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to look back 15 years on. It, the book, Journey of Man, was recently added to the Princeton Science Library catalog. And this is a catalog that basically is meant to ensure that these classic science books, you know, and honestly, they're classics. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, Descent of Man, J.B.S. Haldane's The Causes of Evolution, Einstein, etc., John Gillespie, you know, some of the most amazing science books ever written. They added Journey of Man to it. And, yeah. you know, that's a huge honor. When I was writing it, I wasn't quite like I was still completely a scientist. Back then, I was not used to being like a public intellectual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, scientists are always concerned about what their peers are going to think. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things the filmmakers kept telling me, like when I was learning how to do pieces to camera, talk to people through a camera lens, they were like, you can't let doubt creep in. People want you to be authoritative. Yes, you can catch what you say in scientific terms. You can say, you know, there are other sides to this argument, but you have to take a stand for what you believe is right. And when I was writing the book, I'm like, you know, I think this is kind of the pattern we're seeing. I think this is what it means, but you never know. And like the scientific community could have like panned it and, you know, who knows? And in the end, it's it stood up pretty well. You yeah. Know? Yeah. What what going to, specifically to the science in the book, what let's let's do like number one, I was right. And number one, I was wrong in terms of like what at the top of your head. 
from Journey of Man to now? Number one, I was right. Humans, modern humans, did emerge from Africa between 50 and 60,000 years ago. Now, we now know that there's a little bit more complexity. Obviously, you know, we've talked a lot on these podcasts about interbreeding with Neanderthals. Probably there was an earlier migration. I actually mentioned this in the book. I talk about Kafsa and Shkol. I mean, we've mm. known about archaeological evidence yeah. for people in the Middle East as early as 120,000 years ago. We now know that it's as early as 170,000 years ago from the new find in Israel. There were kind of, you know, proto-human migrations. But in terms of the migration that we all living outside of Africa today, trace our ancestry back to, that did emerge from Africa within the last 50 to 60,000 years, only 2,000 human generations. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is the most astounding finding that genetics has added to the debate on human origins. Yeah, like a specific time. Specific well, it's just in, in how recently it happened. Yeah. Because when I was learning about anthropology in the 1980s, multi-regionalism was kind of, you know, in many ways, kind of the accepted mm -hmm. version of the story. And so what which, is multiple? Which means, you know, something like Homo erectus came out of Africa one and a half, two million years ago, mm -hmm. and different human populations, races, for lack of a better term, Europeans, East Asians, Native Americans, evolved separately over the course of a million and a half, two million years. Well, 50,000 years is nothing. Exchanging gene flows, though, I think yeah, it's like phyletic, yeah. gran anagenesis through phyletic gradualism. It's, it's a classical form of speciation where we all become human all across the world. And this model is almost a punctuated event where all of a sudden this human lineage explains all across, the, all across the world, all across Eurasia and beyond Eurasia, which is new, um, getting to the new world, getting to Oceania, Australia, these these are new areas. In fact, like even parts of Siberia, which it seems were not accessible to hominids until modern humans with their cultural toolkit, you know, came to the fore. Now, in your book, you talk about like northern and southern. Would you would you still hold to that, or how do you northern, feel? Northern southern migration, inland yeah. and coastal, and there, that was in the documentary yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. I think that is still TBD. I actually don't know that anything other than ancient DNA is ever going to allow us to disentangle that because there's been so much recent migration. Yeah. So trying to use extant populations, people alive today, to talk about events that happened 60,000 years ago, really, really hard. Especially in regions like India where there's been a lot of subsequent migration, mixing, extinction, yeah. and so on. So, you know, I would argue that probably that Y alu polymorphism the M1, the very first Y polymorphism that was described by my camera back in the early 90s, that gave rise to DNA. I think that might be the remnant of an initial kind of proto out of Africa migration that predates that 50 to 60,000 year ago one. Yeah. Consistent with that, you know, D is the dominant lineage that's found in, say, the Andamanese, mm -hmm. who are kind of a relictual population that have been isolated from everything else for at least 30,000 years, off in the islands in the, in the Andaman Sea, east of India. The D is common in Japan, too. D is common in Japan. Is, yeah. So it's, it's like got, a, it's got a funny distribution. Yeah. There was a time, around the time I was writing Journey of Man, you know, the simplicity of the model it is kind of silly today, but the assumption was literally it was a one-way migration out of Africa, Serial and then, founder of that, and then yeah. Africans like were isolated after that. We now know that there were there was a you know a fair amount of back migration. Into so, Africa. in terms of what you would change or what you were wrong on, what would you say? Certainly, talking about the Neanderthals mm -hmm. not being related to us, yeah, um, we now know that was incorrect. But it took ancient DNA to fix that to convince people. You know, Princeton when they you know approached me about publishing this new edition. They said, we'd like you to write a new forward. And, you know, we want you to talk a little bit about how things have changed in the last 15 years. And I said, yeah, there are two things that really stand out. One is that, you know, the ease of obtaining whole genome sequences from, you know, modern humans is, you know, it's become trivially easy and very cheap. You know, whether you're scanning SNPs on a chip or you're literally sequencing entire genomes, it's like easy to generate huge amounts of data now. And you can see things that you could never see before yeah. as a result. And the other big advance has been ancient DNA. And that's really changed a lot of things. You know, the thing that I got wrong, and I, it's not my fault, but I, you know, we were using the tools that we it's had. It's called science. Time. It's called science. Estimating the ages on some of the lineages, the time depth mm -hmm. was overestimated in a lot of cases. So I talked about R1B likely being, you know, Ice Age. You know, yeah. it's, it's a Pleistocene lineage, and the high frequency in Western Europe is due to the repopulation of Northwestern Europe, Britain in particular, out of a refugium in southern Spain, you know, around 12, yeah. 13, 14,000 years ago. You're using microsatellites, right? Using microsatellites to estimate the ages. 
And so we were overestimating the ages of these lineages. And we now know that R1B, for instance, within Europe has spread a lot through Bronze Age migrations, yeah. and, and R1A certainly has. Yeah, there was so there was a scene in the documentary, because I, I rewatched it recently, and you were... Um, you went to Europe and you talked about your ancestors. And I think if you had filmed that today, it would be a little different because you know that most of your ancestors arrived in that location in Western Europe in the Bronze Age, not in the Pleistocene, as we had all assumed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that way of thinking about human population history permeated archaeology. Yes. And as a result, genetic anthropology in that era. So in the 1990s, the early noughts, the idea was that you didn't have a lot of population movements and replacements. People basically tended to stay in the same place and cultures moved around and everybody was happy, kumbaya, they all got along. We learned farming from people in the Middle East and, you know, it transitioned culturally. Pots, not people, right? Pots, not <laughs> exactly. people is like the archaeological, the culture, which it does happen in some cases. But I will say, you know, Spencer and I both know some of the researchers that have been working in this ancient DNA. And when the first stuff came out in the late 2000s, I think um, there was one hawk, I think, came with an empty DNA of farmers in Europe. And they look like nothing today. They look much more like some types of Middle Eastern, but not even modern Middle Eastern. That was, I remember when it came out, I didn't even know what to think. Yeah. It yeah was, so I, I was a co-author on that paper. You were, okay. Um, that was one of the early genographic ancient DNA papers, if it's the one that I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, so Wolfgang Hock, who was you know, one of our postdocs. Yeah, I mean, and the story now, of course, is, yeah. you know, there's a lot of replacement going on. Yeah, I mean. And, and the people you look at in any given region today, certainly in Europe, like they're nothing like the people who lived there three, four, five thousand years ago in all likelihood. Yeah. Or very little. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of the journey of man context, men in particular seem to have traveled a lot over really, really, really wide expanses. Well, and, you know, I think it's it's intriguing. I think it's important to note that, you know, a lot of the Y chromosome lineages in places like Europe, and I suspect, you know, as we look further afield in places like India and the Middle East, seem to date back to the Bronze Age. Yeah, that's really, the really the formation of empires and large armed groups of people with very strong, powerful weapons and, you know, highly trained. And, you know, probably a lot of human diversity was lost as these empires expanded. And by lost, I mean, like, it was killed off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a, a paper that came out, I think, last fall, uh, looking at the genetic diversity with whole genomes out of Papua New Guinea. And what they noticed there is there is a lot of diversity between groups, so FSD, in Papua. And they suggest that it might be because they never transitioned to the Middle Age. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you are killing people with stone, maybe you can't get the same scale as you could if you did it with bronze. Well, think about the process of making a really well-crafted stone, you know, spear point. Yeah. You know, that's going to take you a while, even yeah. if you're an expert, like stone hafter or whatever they call them, versus like, you know, casting a hundred bronze arrowheads at a time. It's like trivially simple. I mean, you know, I spend a lot of time in museums when I travel and I travel a fair amount. And one of the things you always see in literally every history museum is like Bronze Age axes and Bronze Age arrowheads and all this stuff. Like they made a lot of weapons because they were always at war, basically. <laughs> I mean, if you did a journey of man today, I think there would be some issues with it would become somewhat dark. Well, you know, a little bit like some of the, you know, fantasy films. Conan the Barbarian. Are, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be, I mean, maybe it would do well. I'm just saying that it would be very different. I mean, Journey of Man was kind of inspirational about these like ancient Paleolithic people that left Africa and then they settled these places and they are the ancestors. Well, it turns out not. Yeah. I mean, we took the extreme points on the compass, if you will, to make the story a little simpler. Um, you know, it was. It was a tool, a storytelling tool that we use. You know, you start off with the San Bushman in Southern Africa, and yeah, their genetic lineage is really, really divergent. They're an old population. There's been more recent admixture, but they still, you know, as a population, pretty damn old. You know, populations living in Australia, the Aborigines have probably been pretty isolated for at least 30,000 years again, maybe as much as 50,000 years. Native American populations. So these, these populations where it's like the initial settlement of a region, mm -hmm 
they've been around for a long time. Even yeah. though there may have been later, you know, introgression and admixture with other groups and so on, like the points on the compass, I think that story is still true. But it's these regions where you've had a lot of migration. And Europe is, you know, the best known example, the best studied example right now. I think India is, is going to be getting there soon. Yeah. Well, in the documentary, there was a scene where you talked about how with the HGDP, Human Genome Diversity Project, they are sampling in indigenous peoples all around the world to get, you know, the, quote, pure populations as opposed to these cosmopolitan city people, which there is some logic to that. And yet the reality is we now know that in large parts of the world, there are no pure people. Everybody is admixed. They're from like, you know, fusions of very diverged groups that mixed in the Bronze Age. Yeah, I mean, and we knew that at the time as well. The idea is you want to skew as much in favor of, it's not so much purity, it's more geographic context. Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking about Australian Aborigines living in Australia, like in all likelihood, they're going to give you a reasonable glimpse of some of the early settlers, even if there's been later migration and mixing, certainly a better glimpse than the average person walking down the street in Sydney today, who's likely to be Greek or British, in, yeah. you know, origin, you know, so the goal is it's to try and find that deeper geographic connection so that you're, you're, you're skewing in favor of deeper history rather than the history of the last 500 years. So, you know, in the documentary, I think, and also in the book, you alluded to the fact that you had to talk to these, you know, indigenous people who were greatly skeptical of uh, some of these assertions that you were making from the science. How did you deal with that? There's a good discussion that I had with um, a guy named Greg Inabla Gabay Singh, um, who is, you know, Sikh and European a real mix, but also Australian Aborigine. And in the film, he's speaking for his tribe of Aborigines in Australia. And he says, you know, I just don't buy this story. You know, we've got our own stories. We think everybody might have come from here. You know, we believe in our song lines. We were sung into existence. And, you know, we're related to the animals and the plants and the rocks in this region. And, you know, this whole idea of a recent migration from Africa just doesn't jive with what we've always been told. And I, you know, I explained to him, listen, you know, what we as scientists are trying to do, and, you know, modern science is very much, you know, a European invention. You know, many of us have lost touch with the older stories, the stories of origins. And we use science as a tool to go out and try and figure out what those stories are. And this is the scientific version of the story. And this is something we ran into a lot with Genographic, where, you know, we would sometimes be told, you know, we're afraid that what you discover with the DNA may conflict with you know, our, our, you know, received wisdom. And the idea is that, you know, we hope that it will complement that and not mm -hmm. completely replace it. I, humans need a sense of group identity. And whether you get that from, you know, group membership and oral traditions that have been passed down, or you get it from organized religion, or you get it from belonging to a club, as, you know, de Tocqueville talked about, you know, Americans are very prone to joining clubs, in part because they've all immigrated here and they want that sense of identity. Humans need a sense of group identity. We don't want to take that away from anybody. Mm -hmm. But we want to, you know, add to the complexity of the story. Yeah. You know, everybody is all related. We can, we can prove that genetically. Yeah. And, you know, I do have to say, um, in the defense of, quote, indigenous peoples, the Irish Book of Invasions describes what happened in Ireland, now we know, much better than what we would have said 10 to 15 years ago based on what archaeologists knew. Yeah, and listen, some of the, the greatest opposition to the project was in the Americas. And if you look at the history of, you know, encounters in the Americas where, you know, thinking about it, I've been rereading the book 1491, mm -hmm. um, which Charles is all Zeman. about, yeah, which is all about, you know, the Americas before the Europeans arrived. And, you know, Europeans start to explore the Amazon and they see it as this teeming ancient wilderness that's been untouched by humans. And in fact, there were densely populated places in the Amazon and they were killed off by guns, germs and steel, particularly the germs. 95% of the population dying out in some places. There's not a very happy history of, you know, European Native American encounters. So it's understandable that there's mistrust and, you know, and sometimes, in some cases, just outright, you know, ant antagonism to, you know, these ideas. So, I mean, in the documentary, you had some in exchanges with indigenous peoples, but um, did you talk, did you get some feedback from creationists at all? Because, I mean, you know, we do use this mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosomal Adam. I mean, how did that work out? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think there is a misunderstanding among people who believe in, you know, the literal story in the Bible, you know, creationism. You know, I, I think some of them believe that, you know, we found genetic evidence for the stories in the Bible. And, you know, in a way, like Genesis, you know, Genesis was written by humans. Okay, this is not the word of God. This is the word of people, you know, supposedly interpreting things that happened. And Genesis is meant to be a metaphor. And if you take it as a metaphor, like we all descend from a you know small population that existed in a particular location at some point in the past, everybody alive today is a descendant of that population. At that metaphorical level, the story isn't so different. And so we actually didn't get that much opposition from creationists. Okay. Okay. You know, certainly less than I would have expected. I mean, in some ways, it's not even your target audience. Yeah. I mean, they're That's they're true. not interested in all this fancy science. Yeah. They already know their own history, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. To some extent, just like the indigenous Australians think yeah. that they know their history. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, your audience was science-savvy, you know, PBS watchers, and that's who it was geared to, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's it's been really interesting to see what has stood up and what hasn't, and, you know, to think about what might be coming in the next 15 years. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of going forward with uh, Y chromosomes, like, you know, we're at whole genomes now, and the whole genomes have been showing some interesting things. The um, a rapid population expansion 4,000 years ago, you can see it in the whole genomes, aside from the ancient DNA. Well, and, and also, you know, probably the most interesting, you know, component of looking at whole genome patterns to me is that you're not simply looking at ancestral baggage, you know, DNA that tells you about the migration patterns, the phylogeny, as you would call it. You're also able to infer things about the function. Our DNA has adapted over time. Yeah. And the only way to tell those selective stories is by looking at whole genome patterns. And so, you know, the lactase story that we tell in the metabolism app and, you know, so many other amazing stories of selection and adaptation, like that's part of the real meat of human evolution and human migration patterns, how we've adapted to different places around the world. The EPAS-1 variant that came in from the Denisovans and the yeah. Tibetan population, that's a freaking amazing story. Well, speaking of selection, I'm going to put this out there. I haven't followed it up in detail. What do you think about the idea that there is selection for certain Y chromosomal lineages due to some... I, I know in Japan, one of the D um, haplogroups has lower fitness because of its effect on sperm function. That's exceptional. But do you buy any of that? Because I mean, that would... Yeah, be, I, I think it's inevitable that you're going to have something like that. You know, you're talking about a non-recombining locus, effectively the Y chromosome or the mitochondrial genome. They're, they're in a single locus. Yeah. You know, they're in complete linkage disequilibrium. But I think what is probably even more important is cultural selection. So the yeah. Genghis Khan Y chromosome, you know, a, a guy who has tremendous power, lots of wives and concubines, and he kills off all the other guys and takes mm -hmm. their women as his concubines and his sons inherit that social status and his proclivities, so to speak. You know, that's going to have a significant impact on that particular Y chromosome lineage. You know, I think that's played a tremendous role, and I yeah. think that's part of the reason why we see these star haplotypes mm -hmm. like R1A, mm -hmm. like R1B, mm -hmm. you know, Nile of the Nine Hostages, a particular R1B sublineage. So what do you mean by star? Um, so these are recent Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA lineages, particularly Y chromosome, uh, that trace back to a common ancestor within the relatively recent past, mm. within the last 1,000, 2,000 years. They're much more widespread than they should be given yeah. their age. And so it was probably selection that drove them to high frequency. And so when you're kind of creating a network of how all of these lineages are related to each other, you've got this big kind of circle that sticks yep. out with a lot of, you know, minimally derived lineages yeah. around. So it, it's basically been driven to fre high frequency very recently. I mean, I think one way to think about it may be like if anyone has ever crystallized salt, if you allow it to kind of grow organically, it's this complex structure, which is a normal phylogeny. But if you boil it off, it's pretty simple. And with a star haplotype, obviously, there hasn't been that much time for a lot of complex structure. Like something just exploded, right? Now, some people have said, as we, you know, we've been talking about this past week, that maybe the Genghis Khan haplotype is not the Genghis Khan haplotype. And we just can expect these things with Y chromosomes, blah, blah, blah. I would say um, I do not know of equivalents on the mtDNA. There is some evidence, I believe, um, I've heard from Chinese colleagues in the Han Chinese population for founding maternal lineages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if any of that has been published yet, but the places where you would see it would be in these matrilineal societies, really. Yeah. You know, so again, most societies being patrilineal, you know, it's all about who your dad is and the clan he belongs to. 
if you flip that so it's all about who your mom is and the clan she belongs to, then you're going to start to see those patterns. The, the only issue with, with you know, women, obviously, is there's a there's more of a rate limit per, per Well, there is. There certainly is. That is that be. is certainly true, yeah. So it's it's easier for guys to you you can't, know, have I mean, an outsized it, genetic in that. <laughs> I think the, the Guinness Book of Records is like 45 for some woman in Germany who had kept having twins and triplets. <laughs> which is obviously a genetic issue there but yeah. i mean that that's yeah. very rare and i'm surprised she survived yeah um, whereas she, it is entirely possible and in fact probably likely that genghis khan himself impregnated literally hundreds possibly over a thousand women yeah i mean we know from um even in a, if you look up a wikipedia entry for um i think the modern found, founder of the kingdom of saudi arabia it has the number of sons he has and then you can see that it says approximate number of daughters because <laughs> they didn't even bother counting all of them there're just so many of them yeah and like the number of sons probably doesn't include all of them so there are people alive today that are male who have hundreds of children and if you can think of that compounding like compounding interest that's going to be crazy, and I think that's probably what's driv driving the star-shaped phylogenies. So, you know, we've been talking for a while. I want to take um, a couple of questions that we got from Roberta Estes' la um, blog uh, about Brian Sykes' book, Seven Daughters of Eve. Like, how, how do you feel like that's, that's held up? A lot of people still read these books. All European women are descended from these seven mothers. Seven, you know, maternal lineages, mitochondrial types. Brian took a slightly different approach than I did in writing his book. You know, he gave names to various people, the founding mothers of these lineages. Ursula, I remember Ursula. Ursula is haplogroup U and, and so on. Um, so there's some of that stuff that's highly fictionalized. And, you know, again, with any of the work that was done back in the knots, the dates, I think, are way off on a lot of these estimates, the ages of some of the lineages. But no, I mean, those are still the most common mitochondrial lineages in Europe. In terms of the details of how they moved around, where they originated, I think, you know, all that's up in the air. mtDNA is is harder to work with because, you know, counterintuitively perhaps, women tend to move around more in traditional populations, certainly at a local level. Yeah. And so the signal gets kind of smeared between mm -hmm. populations. Men tend to jump and women it's kind of a continuous process of bride exchange between neighboring paternal lineages, I think is the story, yeah. right? So this is another question from Roberta Estes uh, blog. Has any DNA test been done on the tribes in the Andaman Islands? Many of these tribes are not in contact with anyone. If yes, what's their story? Do they have links to Aborigine people of Australia and the Dravidians of South India? That's a lot of questions, but I That's I a lot of questions. I and and I would love to do, you know, an entire podcast on the Andamanese. Because they're, they're just one of these fascinating puppies. So Andaman Islands, you know, mentioned them earlier. They're off the east coast of India, out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a sea called the Andaman Sea after the islands themselves. They're a little archipelago of islands. And they're inhabited by people who basically look like the Aita, you know, the Negrito populations of Southeast Asia, uh, the Ati. They look more kind of Central African, almost like Central African pygmies than anybody else in the region. They're they very, don't look Asian. They're they very dark-skinned and they don't have look kinky Indian. hair. Yeah. And, you know, so they're phenotypically an outlier in this part of the world. And they're out in the middle of the ocean on these islands. And, you know, the question has been, like, where do they come from? And many of them don't want to have any contact with the outside world. The Sentinelese, for instance, are famous for, you know, firing gigantic arrows and throwing spears at anyone who comes near the shore. They kill anyone who tries to make contact That's with them. That's why they're still around. That's why they're still around. Yeah. <laughs> But some of them have been sampled by Indian scientists over the years. There are some DNA samples. From the Angi on the main, yeah. the, 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 the greater Andaman. And, you know, they're members of this Y chromosome haplogroup D, yeah. which I think represents a very early migration out of Africa. The whole genome data is a little more equivocal. They're connected to India, but again, it's 30,000 years ago or more. Yeah. That well, so they came through, um, I think if you look at the uh, topography during the Ice Age, there was a they were connected to what is today Myanmar or Burma. And so they came from that area. But yeah. obviously they're connected to South. And of course the people living in Myanmar today look nothing like the Andamanese. So they really are like some, you know, to a certain extent, a relictual population. Well, they're the only like, I think authentic pure hunter, ga like ancestral hunter gatherers in Asia. All the others, they switch back and forth or, you know, they do other things. So, you know, they're the only ones that are like the Pygmies or the Khoisan in Asia. Yeah. And if I had to guess, 
I would say they're probably most closely connected to the Veda populations of southern India. Yeah, so they're the indigenous group in Sri Lanka, and they're like the Ainu in Japan. They're heavily mixed now, and so we don't have any quote unquote pure Veda left. Yeah, you know they don't even speak their own language. So yeah, we do. Like as Spencer said, we do have some genetics. We don't have genetics from all of them. Who knows if the Sentinelese are totally different? One thing that we have found um, in the ancient DNA. And to some extent, even in the modern DNA, some of these indigenous like hunter gatherer or, you know, not fully agricultural people that didn't go through Bronze Age, you know, stage are genetically very distinct from each other, even if they're very close neighbors. So the classical example is for several thousand years in Germany, hunter gatherers and farmers resided near each other. And the genetic distance between the two groups is equivalent in FST units to what that between Chinese and Northern Europeans. Right? So that happened in Europe during the Neolithic. When you look at places like Papua, you see these sorts of elevated FSTs too. So it could be that the Sentinelese are quite different. We don't know because... Yeah, in all likelihood, they probably are. And the other part of the question... We is, don't know what language they're speaking. I mean, it's it's fascinating. Well, I've flown over yeah. Sentinel Island before. and There's it's, some YouTube videos, and they're kind of hard to make out, so maybe we don't know. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. like, there are Andaman Islanders that are in the primary Andaman Islands, and um, their language is not related to any others, to my knowledge. I mean look it up but they're ling- linguistic isolate i believe so and you know unfortunately they're well not unfortunately but i mean they're mixing a lot with settlers from the mainland and also they have high mortality rates because disease just the standard stuff that happens unfortunately to hunter gatherers when they meet farming populations the other part of the question was um the links to the Aust- aborigine people of australia and the dravidians of south india now that was um i wonder if this question came because that was kind of a bit of the documentary where you were genotyping people in Tamil Nadu, um, men in Tamil Nadu for their Y chromosomes. And how do you think that's held up? It's hard to say. I mean, listen, at that time depth, there have been so many recent, more recent migrations, at least, on the mainland that you've erased a lot of the signal that, you know, would have given you an insight into that coastal migration. You know, best example of this is when we talk about Denise of an admixture. Mm-hmm. Um, Denisovan described from, you know, that pinky bone and the tooth in a cave in, in the Altai Mountains in Siberia. But essentially all the admixture we see in human populations today is east of Wallace's line over in places like New Guinea. And anything that, you know, it must have been on the mainland as well, but, you know, it was all erased by later migrations. And so, you know, very hard to say there's no clear connection between the Andamanese and the Australian Aborigines, but you're talking about something that's 50,000 years old. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that anything at that time depth, really hard to see a clear I, connection. I think one big difference between now and then is we appreciate so much more the dynamism of human population migration. At that time, I feel like we had this skeleton framework of we came out of Africa, we settled down, and here we are. And perhaps that was just a limitation of the data, but that's how people were thinking. And I remember reading papers. I remember reading books. And that was the primary thought. Like, we are the children of the Pleistocene. You know, we have a Pleistocene mind, et cetera, et cetera. And now it turns out there's all this churning during the Bronze Age and earlier. And, you know, the big picture is the same. The big framework is the same of out of Africa and whatnot. And you were talking about going to Australia, going to the New World. A lot of that holds up. And yet there's a lot of specifics that have been overturned. And... That's kind of how science is. Like you tend to get the big theories correct, and then a lot of the details need to be worked out, and they change. Yeah, and it's move a around. refinement process. Yeah, that is the nature of science. Science is about constantly refining your interpretation in the light of new data. And yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there was a, I don't know, an almost like Rousseauian attitude about indigenous populations that permeated the way we design these studies under Cavalli Sforza. So this is, you know, Cavalli is a relatively old guy. Like he started doing all his major work in the 50s and 60s. and You know, so he's influenced by ideas from, you know, way back. And there's this idea that like these populations exist in a state of nature, relatively pure, you know, where they are and they've always lived in the same place. And so by going out and studying these populations like the Pygmies, like the Andamanese, you know, like people living in remote valleys in the Pamirs, like I've been to, like you're going to capture some insight into the distant past. And it ignores the fact that populations, as you said, are always dynamic, always changing, always mixing. And the people who live there today may or may not be the direct descendants of the people who lived there a few thousand years ago. 
Yeah, I mean, like, let's think about Europe, which we know a lot about because we have a lot of ancient DNA. It's cold, and there's a lot of European researchers. The funding's easy to get. We know in the Pleistocene itself, there were one, two, three replacements in the Pleistocene. So the hunter-gatherers that the farmers from the Middle East, before the people from the steppe arrived, met were the last of the various Pleistocene peoples. And we just have a lot of samples from Europe because it's cold and there's a lot of research facilities in Europe and there's a lot of funding in Europe. Who knows what it could be like elsewhere? Right? We don't. Europeans might not be that different than elsewhere in Eurasia or in Africa. We know the Bantu expansion has totally reshaped the continent within the last 4,000 years. It's on the edge of history. When you know the ancients, when the Phoenicians and other groups like Ethiopians and Egyptians were sending voyagers down along the East African coast, it was probably totally different because there were totally different people there three or 4,000 years ago, you know? And that's just giving us a sense of the scale of like how close to the present a lot of these changes are. And yet the present's not that different perhaps from the distant past. We're all ultimately human and we have to start with the assumption that the same dynamics are going to apply everywhere. Now, as Spencer said, guns, germs, and steel, there's these cultural modifications. And yet we have like the same central themes that are coursing through our history and even though journey of man has changed a lot in the specifics i think the general framework i mean it's still a very informative i mean frankly like i watched it recently it's still a very informative documentary i mean you are my boss so i have to say that (laughs) but i'm also being sincere it is a very informative documentary even if you watch it today as a layperson because its general framework is correct and the way you have to the way you think about the past in the generality is actually correct in terms of these migrations and these, you know, fissions between different groups and the expansion out of Africa. In terms of recent human origins, we are still in the Journey of Man era um, in terms of un- our understanding. It's a lot of the details, and it's taking the dynamics in the Journey of Man and just cranking them up. Like, there's more turnover, more expansions, yeah. more Y chromosome, more paternal, frankly, driven demographic turnover. I mean, this is a delicate way to say what really happened, mm-hmm. but... I, th- I think that's one of the big takeaways. So um, yeah, I agree. Listen, I, I think it's it has stood up pretty well. I think there's obviously a lot of work that you know we need to be doing in the future on you know the impact of more recent migrations. Again, I think ancient DNA is you know the greatest thing since sliced bread. And you know every time David Reich publishes a paper, you know everybody reads it because something amazing and unexpected is going to come out of it. And you know Eska Willis Lev and all the other guys working in the field. You know I'd like to end by just talking about. You know, why I undertook this in the first place, you know, not just the book, but like why I devoted my life or have devoted my life and continue to, to studying this. And it's really like, you know, I often begin talks by asking people to do a little thought experiment. Imagine that you are back in the time of the European age of exploration. So you're, say, on a boat with Captain James Cook. And you're crashing around from island to island in the Pacific Ocean, for instance, as he you know, spent most of his time exploring. And every time you crash ashore, there are people living there. And that doesn't surprise you. It's like just accepted that humans live everywhere. And you notice you know, the languages may be somewhat like languages you've heard before on another island, but somewhat different in some ways, or maybe their skin color is slightly different, or they look a little different. Or you, know, you just notice these similarities and differences, but you never really question you know, that there are humans everywhere. And you know, trying to answer the question of why there are humans everywhere, and the timing of how they got there, and the routes they followed, that's what has always fascinated me. And that's what motivated me to write Journey of Man. It's what, you know, motivates me to create the products we created yeah. in Cytome, to continue to write books. I'm working on my fourth book right now. And, you know, will continue to motivate me scientifically in the future. It's just a really fascinating, basic human question. Why are we everywhere and how did we get there? Yeah, it's an eternal question. And I think I think we can end it there. Yeah, All right. sounds good. Thanks, Rizzi. Uh-huh. For more information about Incytome, our podcasts, and our genetic products, check out our website at incyto.me. That's I-N-S-I-T-O dot M-E.